Hold up, dude. Today, I decided to do a uh, rebuttal to a video I just watched from God Love Moments. It's the title is How John One uh, John One to Three Does Not Support LDS Church. I just saw it's a 10 minute long video and I highly recommend that you watch uh, this video because I'm going to refute this video. And it's kind of funny considering that just last night I learned some very interesting thing about that verse in the last couple of days. How the argument that he's trying to make does not work. And it's, it's actually really funny that he's actually trying to make it. And there's only one thing that he actually got it right. Only one. And the only thing that he got right is it is the concept of in the beginning. He said that in the beginning, it's essentially a concept of indeterminate amount of time because they can't really express when and in the past. That is true. And he goes on and says, there was the word. So, and the word was with God. So he tries to make the argument that this is a uh, proof that Jesus is co-eternal with God before the creation of the world. Because, uh, because, uh, because if you read the entire uh, verse, is, is that Jesus created created everything and all of that. So he basically made, so he's basically a reflection of the creation myth in Ge Genesis. Something that was actually pointed out to me, you also have a, an interesting argument being made in Job where Jesus well is basically I mean God basically said before the foundation of the world where the sons of the most high rejoice when they created the world basically he was talking about the council of, of gods, the angels. Based on his argument, he will imply that, that, that these angels are co-eternal. After all, these angels existed before the foundation of the world. This is a double standard. The Trinitarian tries to use. We're well, going to try to pick a verse and say this fits the Trinity. Where he's like, oh, this is this uh, supposed to like, this demonstrate that Jesus is coordinated with the Father, and and uh, because uh, because it shows that Jesus was there with the Father before the foundation of the world. And all things was made uh, was made and nothing was made without him. Okay? And yet you have in Job God making the argument 
that angels also created the world. Are they not? Are they not uh, co-eternal as well? Using the same logic, but of course, a Trinitarian would say, "No, no, 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 no! That's not what I'm saying. That's you're just strawmanning me." Hence the double standard. The width, Jesus, uh, and technically, the word is a mistranslation because. Technically, it should be logos. It in Greek, logos means more than just word. It's like it's like it's re- God's reason. It's, it's something that is His reason. It's wisdom. It's like something that is much more profound than it's just His mere word. And another part is getting mistranslated as well. It says that it was with God. No. The actual coin Greek, it says with the God. Trinitarian always removed the word the when it translated. Why? Why do you might ask? Because... Let's define a trinity. They want to. Tr- they say there is one God in three distinct persons: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're not each other, but they're fully God. They're they're fully. Um, there's, uh, they're not portion of, of God. There's fully, Jesus is fully, uh, fully the Father. Is uh, the Father is fully Christ, but but the, but they're distinct from each other. Somehow, God is in three person, but they're not modes like modalism. Modalism says. There's one being in three person, but they're the same person. So this is basically the same argument that I'm making, but the difference. Basically, it's the same. There's one being in three person, but one says they're the same person. The other says they're a distinct person. Hence, the one says they're a mode. The other says, no, they're just in different role. And when the Jesus is incarnate, the uh, Jesus has two wheels. Two wheels. He has his divine wheels and he has his human wheels. Is fully divine and few, uh, fully humans, and Jesus is learned obedience in his human will, and it's his and his human will that is subordinate to his Father, and that creates all kind of kinds of contradictions. I am, I am not going to get get into that that part just yet. I just want to finish the. Uh, finish it. John 1 1. First. So, as I said, the Logos was with the God. But how do we know it's the God? Because we also have another reference later in John. In John 10 uh, 10 30. If I remember correctly, on top of my head, where is uh, no is it? 
He said, no, no, he said, it's, it's uh, the far out of one. It's, and he said, like, basically the one that says that uh, the, uh, the one true God um, that I have been sent by the one true God. Literally, Jesus says the Father is the one true God. The same kind of phrasing that you'll find in John 1.1. 1, 1. And the same kind of phrasing you'll also find in Paul's writing. Where you have Tov, uh, I mean in Queen Greece, like Tov Tios, something like that. Like I'm currently learning Queen Greek. I'm trying to memorize the uh, Greek alphabet. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. Kind of hard to learn, especially when you have long COVID. That's an entirely different topic. But I'm going. I'm just going. to leave it as such for now. When. So. You have multiple instances where you have the God or the one true God as in Matthew or um, in Luke, like all throughout the New Testament where the Father is a reference of the one true God. But the Trinity tries to argue that Jesus Jesus is God so they have to create mistranslation in order to uphold that um, that that theology hey, there's, a, there's another one I think, I think like, like I was listening, where Trinitarians, um, like I don't, like I don't, I'll, be, I'll be posting the links, uh, links in the vi- in the video. You can ch- you can check out the the videos I'm talking about. But quite often, Trinitarian will mistranslate verses on purpose to uphold a false doctrine. And yes, and yes, I will be, uh, the, the links I will be posting is will be connected to another channel, but it's a scholarly, uh, the guy who's, who's doing, doing those things is literally like, like a, He's a scholar who's literally like showing what all the scholars are saying, saying and all that, and what the the uh, manuscripts and all that. So he's he's posing all this evidence. So I'll just just link into that channel. You can check it out. I need all time, and I kind of like like I've been pulling. Uh, the stuff like a little bit all across his channels. There's only like a few videos on this channel, but it's still like absolutely in-depth stuff. Highly recommend it. Like highly recommend. Like the one, I think it's like in Galician, the Galician he was talking about, and it was like, and basically. Basically, um, Trinitarian will purposefully, purposefully mistranslate those verses to kind of make it ambiguous. And when the original language, it literally says something different because if you actually know what the actual language says, it will literally say that Jesus is a creature. 
of God. Wait, Jesus a creature? That kind of kind of makes things a little more more difficult, doesn't it? Which leads to the third clause. Jesus was God. This clause is another miss translation. And a Trinitarian like James White and um, Dan Wallace both admitted that the Coin Greek article is not definite but indefinite. However, because they control the print and press and they control the um, the translation and all that, they force any translation to use a definite article of Jesus was God. When both, and both in their works, like, like, um, in their, like, in a major word, like, uh, the Forgotten Trinity from James White and uh, Beyond Basis from uh, Dan Wallace, they both admitted that the last clause can be translated in three different ways. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. Jesus was a divine being. And there's actually another fourth clause that it can be translated. You can say that Jesus shared this, uh, the same divine essence as the, well, the Logos shared the same divine essence as the Father, as God, because God, in contrast, is the Father. So in reality, let's put it this, this, this entire context, You literally have a, an entire verse that says, in the beginning, it was a Logos. The Logos was with the Father or the God. The Logos shared the same divine essence as the Father. Or you can say the Lagos was a divine being. Because if you say that that Jesus was God, you're literally making a modalist argument. And there was another study that was done by another Trinitarian that that literally argues that saying Jesus was God is not a good translation because of that modulus argument behind it. I also going to link, link that study in the bottom. And it was, it was from him uh, that I got the fourth clause. So now what you so now what you have now you have a verse that 
does not really support an argument that says Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. You have a verse that that doesn't really support. You also have other verses that says that Jesus is a created being. And now you also have Now you have other, other like you literally have a verse that at first it seemed a really, really, really strong support for the Trinity. But it doesn't. And that's the problem with the Trinity. And here's another argument. If Jesus and the Father are the same being, how can you be with yourself? That is a contradiction. So this is why they have to make it Jesus was with God. They have to kind of like make a model to kind of like remove the context to try to say that no 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 God is ambiguous is like this ambiguous entity that we don't really know what that is when the reality the one true God is really the father the source of the divinity And this ambiguous that Trinitarian has to confound in the writings. They have to do it because of the modernist background. Like if you read read their creed, the uh, Especially in an in a, in a Atassian creed, or in a Tatius creed, or whatever the word is, name. It literally describes how Jesus, the, no part of the Trinity can be greater or smaller than any other part. They have to be co-equal, co-eternal, co um a uh, consumption, uh, consumption the co- uh, they literally have to be the same. They, uh, they, no part is greater than the other. The only difference is in role. So it's really, really super, uh, superficial that difference. And it, and it, and it gets you to, co- to uh, contradiction. Because as soon as you start analyzing what that means, the, con- the, con- the Trinity will contradict itself because it will um, contradict all the laws of logic. But Trinitarian don't want to acknowledge those contradiction because they're going to say it's a mystery you're just a feeble human how can your feeble mortal mind can comprehend the infinite mind of God you're just trying to be prideful to try to comprehend the infinite
I just call it this uh, the um, mis the, the mystery uh, uh, fallacy. There are some mis some legend mysteries. But all too often, it has been used as a way to not deal with contradiction that certain Christian um, or face or um, or face when when they when they uh, when they actually face an, um, a theology that contradicts laws of logic. Even the concept of infinite reg regression, which is something that some LDS members advocate, it still has logic behind it. Even the concept of infinity has a lot of logic behind it. Like, um, when you take calculus, you 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 use math to quantify infinities. So there's still some rules of logic behind infinities. Yet. These Christians wants to just say, nah, you can't really comprehend those things. You just have to accept by faith. Even though it just defies all known rules of logic. That's one of my biggest issues. After all, coming back to John 1.1, 1, 1, if Jesus... And the Father are the same being. How can they be with each other? How can Jesus be with God? If they are the same being. The pre-Nicene Church, before the Council of Nicaea, they would teach that the Father is unbegotten. He's the one true God. That Jesus is a separate being from the Father, a separate God. However, his divinity is completely dependent upon the Father. So this is why, this is how the Christian will make the case that they're not polytheists, rather monotheists, because they say that that, uh, that Jesus' divinity is dependent upon the Father, but a polytheist who said that Jesus' divinity, uh, divinity is independent from the Father. Yet, Jesus' divinity is only a portion from the Father's divinity. It's not the whole substance, but a portion. This is what is called subortionism. Notice, there's no contradictions. 
Now going back in John 1 1, Jesus is with the Father. And Jesus, divinity comes from the Father. But he's still a separate being from the Father. And he's subordinate to the Father. So now you have a divine being that is, that is able to be with another divine being. And there is no contradiction. And the incarnation is literally Jesus devoiding himself from the Father's divinity to take it upon human flesh. But again, he's subordinate to the Father. And the Father is always greater than him. And he's obedient to the Father. And he is and he's been sent by the Father. And he's being obedient to his Father. And at all time, he's doing his father's will. No contradiction. Unlike the Trinity. But notice how this view of subortionism reflects the LDS teachings of you of Jesus and the Father. That Jesus is the firstborn of the Father. Oh yeah, before, uh, before, before I go further, going back to my comment about creature, Jesus being a creature, I was like, look, look, looking up a little bit about Begotten, like a beget and all that. Basically, the word begotten is means giving birth to. You're having an offspring. Jesus. When he, is, when he says is, uh, is uh, the begotten of the Father, literally means the Father gave birth to Jesus. That's literally what that means. And at any given time, that phrase, is always been described to women giving birth. Another thing that kind of like look it up is about creature. How they view creature. They viewed, at that time period, there's essentially two kinds of creature. Rational creature and irrational creature. <sighs> irrational creature or animals. That's literally what they are. Animals. Rational creature? Humans. Angels? G 
Jesus and that kind of that kind of thing. I've yet found but I have not found them being described as irrational creature. But what we do know the logos is referred as God's reason. And according to scripture, it is refer Jesus was referred as a creature. Another word, a rational creature. Another thing that I came across recently <coughs> a quotation of basically you have the father begetting Jesus and then you have in, uh, angels be begetting after Jesus. Literally the same language are being used. Then you have Lucifer being described as an offspring of God by people like Augustine of Hippo. Angels that are offspring of the Father that came after Jesus. So why do why am I making this argument? One of the last argument that God loves Mormon made was that Jesus made nothing was made without Jesus. And therefore it refused the argument of countless angels, or basically the countless gods in, in, in heaven. This is not true. Now, whether or, one, whether, whether or not you believe the Adam God theory is true or not, it does not matter. But the doctrine of exaltation, or you could say deification, theosis, 
is completely what the LDS teaches. And let's briefly talk about the plan of salvation, how it works. You have the Father, Heavenly Father. Then you have Jesus, the firstborn of all God's children. Yes, you could assume that God has a wife, because we do believe that marriages are, are eternal. So we can, we can assume there is a uh, heavenly mother. We don't exactly know what's her role. And, the, and the, the last time I checked, a uh, uh, check, uh, the only thing that is known is Joseph Smith talked to her to a group of women, and he's just kind of like, but we don't know what has been said to those women. That's basically all we really know about that. But what you do know, Jesus was the firstborn of God's children. And yes, he was born from, from pre-existing intelligence. We don't believe in the ex nihilo, and we're not going to debate about ex nihilo or ex materia. No, we're going to debate in regarding about the whole did Jesus, uh, Jesus did co-eternally exist with the Father? As we already established, John 1.1 1, 1 does not teach um, that Jesus and the Father are co-eternal, unless you want to say that in Job, the angels were co-eternal with, uh, with, with, with God. And I highly doubt the Trinity wants us want to do that. So you, uh, so we had a bunch of children. They had a bunch of children. All the spiritual, spiritual children. And Jesus was the firstborn, and then you have Lucifer. But we do know Jesus has a special relationship with the Father. He has his, a he's the first one of creation uh, of all creation. And everything else uh, came after him. And Lucifer rebel, and one third of the angels lost. So, and, they lost, and basically, they lost their first estate. So we came here, and we got a body of flesh and bones. So basically, right off the bat, our nature, our essence. Literally change. We no longer have the same nature as we have before. Does that mean we have the same nature as the Father? No, we don't. 
because because his nature his deify his like is he's literally like uh how can i exp uh a metaphor that kind of uh, kind of describe is Like, a, or usually it says that, it, like, we're like seeds, we're like seeds compared to what he is. And yet, when we get a resurrection, we get a salvation. We we'll get the uh, get a solution from the uh, when we don't get uh, 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 resurrected from the dead and uh, get into a celestial kingdom. Our nature will even change even more. The celestial, terrestrial, and terrestrial kingdoms all have different natures in those kingdoms. And our body will have different natures in all of those things. And our natures will be different. The what? And once we re reach the same level as the Father, we will have a whole different level of understanding that we are not going to currently have. But all throughout that process, our natures continue to develop. Does that mean it's like we're like, like larvae changing to butterfly? Not really. I don't see that like what, that way. How can we use that? Evolution. We're evolving into a whole new different state. I don't care if I want to get into a debate about evolution, but the basic concept of evolution is how things are changing, are evolving, whether they're degrading, or improving the, na the nature of things are changing from one state to another. And one of the theories that, that, that human beings came from monkeys and our human nature are greater than monkeys, basically. Because our ceremony is greater than monkeys, we're able to think more logically than monkeys and all that jazz. So our nature is different than monkeys. So we're basically going to evolve into a whole new level of understanding that we're currently not able to. And the next cycle begins. Yet we will always be subordinate to Jesus, who's always going to be subordinate to the Father. Hence, once again, how the verse doesn't really refute LDS. Now, I understand the proposition of what of what um, God of Mormons is doing 
Its proposition is subtle, but it's there. Jesus had to create things out of nothing. And Jesus is unique. And not and what he is is different from everything else. I think I'm gonna leave, leave this video here. I hope you I hope you enjoyed this video. And Merry Christmas.